ECS is all the rage these days. You can hardly have a conversation with anybody about game development, at least in the context of gameplay programming, without somebody bringing up components as if they are the end-all be-all of gameplay programming. But are they truly all they're cracked up to be? Let's break it down. Note that I will be using the terms ECS and component systems interchangeably. I recognize that there's a subtle difference where ECS has a formal idea of a system that can declare its read and write dependencies to get some kind of automatic parallelism, whereas a component system is less formal and is just in reference to the ability to add a bit of data to an entity at runtime. However, the distinction is not important for most of the points I'm going to raise here. If you notice a point where the distinction does actually matter and I don't address it, please let me know in the comments. While my game and engine are written in Jai, the code snippets in this video will be written in a C-like C++ so as to be understandable to most people. Let's begin by enumerating the purported benefits often touted by ECS advocates. These are that ECS, one, allows composition of functionality to create emergent behavior, two, is good for designers, and three, has huge performance benefits. These are mostly half-truth memes that have become highly viral due, at least in part, to some good marketing done by certain companies in the commercial game engine space. What I will hopefully convince you of is that, A, none of these benefits are exclusive to ECS, B, you probably don't need all of these for your game, and C, ECS is nothing more than a compression algorithm. Let's talk about composition. ECS advocates will often say things like, ECS allows you to compose functionality to create emergent behaviors that are not explicitly programmed. This is, as I said before, a half-truth. Composition isn't an outcome of ECS, rather it is a property of it. And there are other ways to get that property. This is not something unique to ECS. It's not even something unique to games. It's just something that games tend to leverage as one way to create interesting gameplay. For example, say you have a campfire and want objects to ignite if they get too close to the fire. In an ECS, perhaps the campfire entity would have some on-fire component, and it would check for entities that get too close and add the on-fire component to the ones that do. Let's see if we can find a way to do this without having all the extra system complexity of components, and just have entities. All we have here is a situation where we need a single bit of information. Is this entity on fire or not? So why not use an actual single bit to denote that by using flags? The idea here is that every entity has all the data that an entity could have, and then you have flags to turn certain behaviors on and off. The code for updating such an entity might look something like this. We iterate through all the entities, skip the ones that aren't active, check the flags, and do certain things based on which flags are set. Going with the on-fire example from before, here we gather all the other entities that are within our access-aligned bounding box, and then set the isOnFire flag on them. We have achieved composition, trivially, without components. This approach works well, and I often start new games with something that looks like this for maximum flexibility when I'm just exploring a design idea. I then gradually pull things out as the design gets more solidified, and I want some more type safety and code clarity. One downside with this approach is that it is difficult to treat the various components homogeneously, because they are just stored as heterogeneous data on the entity. There's no way to, for example, iterate over all the components an entity has, because it's all just unordered data. If you're in a language that has good runtime type information, then you can iterate the fields of the struct and whatnot, but then you also need to map the fields to the entity flag that controls them, which might be fine for certain fields, but some might be controlled by multiple. It just gets hairy quite quickly if you want to be able to treat data homogeneously. Heterogeneity versus homogeneity is a common point of tension when writing new systems, and ultimately you will have to decide which one is more important on an individual system-to-system -system basis. Another potential problem with this kind of solution, and probably the one that jumped out at you at first, is the memory wastage. For certain kinds of games, there may only be a handful of characters, yet all the entities will have this character data on them, taking up space and reducing cache locality. Player data in particular can be the biggest offender because there's often only one of them, and it often has the most data. The issue with this problem is that it's not obvious that it's actually a problem. Reduced cache locality isn't in and of itself an issue. The issue comes when that becomes an actual performance bottleneck, and you discover that by actually measuring. That it feels somehow wrong to have this little bit of wastage is an aesthetic, superstitious problem, not a real, concrete problem. But okay, maybe you're making a game where this does become a performance bottleneck, and you have verified this through profiling. Or maybe you just can't stomach the little bit of wastage for aesthetic reasons. What can you do? A couple options come to mind. You can pull the data out and hold handles to it. Here we've pulled each of the structs out into separate arrays, and the entity struct just holds indices to them. You might be thinking to yourself that this is starting to look like a component system now. If we had a way to index into the arrays with the entity ID alone, then we could remove the indices completely, and this would look even closer to an entity component system. Notice what has happened here. We have functionally the same program, but our memory footprint is shrinking. This is what I meant before about how ECS is just a compression algorithm. We had the composition aspect before, and now, as we decrease our redundancy without changing functionality or capability, we approach a more ECS-looking solution. In fact, this is true if you went the inheritance route as well. Subtyping in general is just a compression algorithm. 
Splitting up a mega struct with all the data and therefore maximum flexibility into derived structs is purely a process of stripping away all the data you know you don't need for a particular kind of entity. That is the definition of compression, which is not to say that it's trivial and you can ignore it. The idea is just that you might not need it, and assuming you do will add unnecessary complexity to your system. Another option for compressing out the wastage is using unions. Say, for example, that we know we will never have an entity that both has the character flag and the draw text in world flag set. In that case, we can use a union so that the memory for both of those structs is overlaid, reducing the amount of wasted memory. The union will still, of course, be the size of the largest element, but any structs less than that will cost nothing. Now let's talk about complexity. Having these properties isn't free. You have to implement and maintain them, fix bugs in them. Adding new features becomes more complex because the code itself is already more complex. It all takes time. If you're an indie developer, time isn't a resource you have a lot of, and you should be ruthless in implementing only the things you actually need if you plan to make any progress in your projects. If the game design you're targeting with your system doesn't need arbitrary levels of flexibility, then you don't need the level of composition that ECS allows for. If you're making a small game, or your game has some concrete number of object types whose properties are well-defined, you might not even need an entity system at all. Take for example a tower defense game. You could have an enemy struct and a tower struct, and have an array of each, and just program the exact thing you need without any sort of system behind it. Systematizing your entities only becomes useful once you need to generalize over all your entities, treating them as if they were homogeneous data for the purposes of serialization, tool making, and modularity. If you decide that you do need enough flexibility to warrant an entity system, then that's totally fine, but it's not a trivial amount of work you're opting into. If you can get away without it, that's a huge win. Or maybe you just want an entity system because you want to make a highly integrated editor. That still doesn't mean you need composition. There's a gradient here, and good software engineering is understanding where your project lies on that gradient and using that to inform your solutions. Creating good tools is hard, and you should only do it if there's a large benefit to doing so. If you're a solo programmer making a game, or even a small team, a code-first approach is often best, as it is the simplest, most flexible, and fastest option, both in developer time investment and in runtime performance. If your team size gets larger and you end up having more specialization, like dedicated level designers, then that's when you will want to start making good tools for your designers. The cost of one or two programmers' time is hugely outweighed by having several designers being highly productive. And the part that is good for designers is the composition aspect. As we've already talked about, composition is less tied to ECS than people think. You can get that composition another way and still have good tools to interface with it. Getting the performance benefits of ECS mostly comes in the S part of the acronym, systems. This is one place where the distinction between ECS and component systems matters. With the formal concept of a system, the idea is that you can define which components a system depends on to read and which components it modifies. The benefit here is that you can write an algorithm to generate a dependency graph of all your systems and then automatically parallelize them since you know all the data dependencies. A system that moves every entity that has a gravity component downward can in principle run in parallel with a system that ticks ability cooldowns and calculates which abilities the player can activate. People often talk about how ECS is good for cache locality, but as far as I can tell, this is another half-truth meme mostly in response to an object-oriented way of programming where you have each entity allocated randomly on the heap and all their data is also randomly allocated on the heap, so you have crazy pointer indirections everywhere. If instead you have a tightly packed array of entities that you iterate linearly and update, as in the composition example from before with the flags, you will have the cache performance you're looking for without having to introduce the concept of a component in your design. The only real, notable performance wins are in the possibility of parallelization. So now we ask the question, do you need this? Are you making a complex enough game that it's actually worth spending the time it will take to ensure that the system works correctly? Multithreading is very, very difficult to get right, and if you aren't making huge games with bajillions of entities, you almost certainly don't need this level of optimization. Indeed, certain designs with highly serial update orders would get no benefit from this auto-parallelization at all, and in some cases it could even be a pessimization because of all the bookkeeping overhead. Additionally, there's nothing about this parallelization that requires components to be involved at all. The real point of systems in ECS is to force the user to define their dependency graph ahead of time, which is orthogonal to whether you have components in your system. So if you had, for example, different entity types, instead of having different component types, you could create this dependency graph. In my case, the component system in my engine accounts for nearly half of the API surface of the entity system in total. This is obviously a non-trivial amount of complexity, and it would be a huge simplification to just rip it out entirely. At this point, I've converted everything in my game code to not use components, but I can't remove it from the engine just yet, because a friend that I share the engine with is still using components. Hopefully at some point in the near future, I can just rip it all out. So what did I end up doing for my game specifically? For a long time in my game, I did the mega struct approach, where I had one entity struct with all the data and a bunch of flags. It worked great. It's maximally flexible. Perfect for the beginning of a project when you're still figuring things out. But once the project started getting bigger, the lack of any type safety started to bother me. So I switched the game over to using components, which I already had in the engine at the time. There was a hero component, an activated ability component, components for the backgrounds, doing the parallax, a component for the damage numbers when a hero gets hit, and so on. Up until this point in my engine, there was only a single entity type, 
you couldn't define multiple. But I realized that if you were able to define multiple, you could achieve composition by having child entities with different types from the parent. The code now looks something like this. Entity base maintains pointers to its parent, children, and siblings in a linked list fashion. Writing a loop that goes through all the siblings, children, or climbs up the hierarchy to parent entities is trivial. It also has a field for which entity type it is, so when iterating over a bunch of entities, I can check its type and pointer cast to access derived fields. Entity base has a local position now. With this hierarchical structure, each entity's position is relative to its parent, so we will have to manually calculate the absolute position to know where to render the entities in the world. Here we start off with the entity's local position, and then climb up the hierarchy, summing up each parent's local position. Once there are no more parents, then that is the entity's absolute position. In the case where the entity never had a parent to begin with, its local position is equivalent to its absolute position, and we can just return that. I have the same sort of thing going on for the entity's scale, rotation, and render order. It's all relative to the entity's parent. For the heroes in my game, I have a hero entity at the top level, and I have a spine animator as a child to that entity. Projectiles and abilities are similar. There's a top level ability entity, and a spine animator as a child entity. Rendering is a matter of iterating over all the spine animators in the scene, and rendering them based on their absolute positions, so that they follow wherever their parent entities are. With this setup, we're able to render heroes and abilities in the same loop, just as if they were components. To store all these heterogeneous entity types, I have a type called entity slot that's a union over all the entity types, and then I just have a single array of that type. You could imagine splitting out each entity type into its own array to limit the wastage from using a union, but I haven't bothered to do that yet. Maybe I will at some point, but keeping it all in one array makes entity ID lookups trivial. Now, as I said before, my real code base is in Jai, not C++. So just for fun, here's what the entity slot struct actually looks like. It uses metaprogramming to generate all the union members. Entity types is an array of types that gets generated by a metaprogram that finds all the structs in the program with an at entity tag as shown here. As for performance, you could easily imagine doing the exact same auto parallelization as ECS by introducing capital S systems that are in charge of updating each entity type, declaring its dependencies, and so on. I don't think this is super important for my game, or most games really, so I'm not going to bother, but you could do that if you wanted. For example, the entity that handles the parallax in the background could run at the same time as the spine animators for all the heroes. Now you might be thinking, well you just reinvented components and called them something different. To which I would say that in your mind, you still have conflated the concept of composition with components. And I invite you to rewatch this video. The win here is that my solution is hugely simplified. The system itself is smaller, the API surface is much smaller, and there are fewer concepts to worry about, all while retaining all the power and flexibility. Problem solving is more straightforward because there's only one concept to worry about, entities. When building systems, all else being equal, simplicity is king. Composition is one of the main wins for component systems over the more traditional, object-oriented approaches. But we have to stop thinking that ECS has some monopoly over composition and recognize that it is simply a property of ECS rather than being inextricably tied to it. We have to wake up to the idea that we can, and should, deconstruct ECS, or any other paradigm, into its own component parts and decide which parts we actually need and build our solution from there. That's good software engineering. Thank you for watching.